Oh, turn your volume up. Okay. I can't. Social media. 
in some form. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, something. Okay, awesome. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay, that's good. If you're not on LinkedIn yet as a student, I would say it's a good idea to add that to your social media profile, to your list of your social media portfolio, because it's going to be important once you graduate here from Cal State East Bay. Okay? And so as we talk about social media and its impact on your life, the reality in the bottom line is social media is there to enhance your life. And as a student and later on as a professional, it's really about being a professional and how you present yourself on social media. And so how you present yourself professionally in the real world is how you should present yourself professionally and always on social media. All right, does that make sense? Like the social media world is like the real world is just virtual. And so I use this example all the time with Facebook. Facebook is about friends, right? And mutual friends, right? Now, if somebody knocked on your door, what's your name, Seth? Jack. Jack. Hey, Jack. What's happening? You answer the door. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm your friend's friend. We have a mutual friend. Her name is Susan. Can I come in and hang out for a bit? Would you let me in your house? Probably not. Probably not. So for me, I probably wouldn't add you as a friend on Facebook. Just because we know the same people doesn't mean that you get access to my social media life and access to my social media profile. One thing to remember about your social media profile is that they are yours and they belong to you and you have total control over who sees what. Most people just don't take the time to set up their settings. So with that in mind, just considering that most people don't take the time to navigate through their personal settings on their pages, we're gonna talk about professionalism in the sense of being a student, being a, a current professional, and then we're gonna align that with social media in your life on social media. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. So let's talk about it. For some, professionalism might be mean dressing, dressing smartly at work or doing a good job. For others, professionalism means being having advanced degrees or maybe certifications. Framed and hung on an office wall. Professionalism encompasses all of these definitions, but it also encompasses much more. But what do you think professionalism is about? Anybody, just throw it out there. Respect. Respect. Self-respect and respect for others, right? Anybody else? The thing is like strictly formal. That's what I think about. You think it's strictly formal? Yeah. There's some protocol involved in being professional, and there's some choices that you have to make as well. You know, it's interesting because there's a Bloomberg report that came out in 2013 that said that college graduates lack professionalism. Do you agree with that? They said, what do U.S. college graduates lack? professionalism. And this is what the staff, the faculty member said. I gave an exam last week and one student showed up 25 minutes late. When the hour ended and I collected the papers, he looked up from his seat, cast a pitiable, oh, I can't believe that word, but I'm going to say pitiful glance, that's not what it said, and mumbled, please, I got here late. May I have another 20 minutes? Do you think that if you came to class late, you should get extra time for an exam? No, not here at Cal State East Bay, but a lot of students do. <laughs> Look up this word for me. P-I-T-I-A-B-L-E. And then we'll probably pronounce it correct. So from this survey, this is what they also found. That, that employers are looking for employable skills like work ethic and timeliness and appropriateness. And appropriateness has various levels to it, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But they also said that current student attitudes are too casual. Like, oh, it's okay if I'm, I'm just five minutes late. No big. Oh. Right? Uh, there's also a sense of entitlement, like this faculty member expressed with asking for more time. And there seems to be a lack of focus. Perhaps from a lot of engagement on social media platforms. Social media, as you know, can be very distracting. Would you agree yeah. with that? I agree too. As a person that teaches social media, I agree that social media is very distracting. Distracting, and you should be uh, laser focused in your activities on social media. But before we get into social media, I want to talk a little bit more about the six traits of a true professional. Let's get into this video. It's short. Being professional.
professional is highly valued in the workplace. It's essential if you want to be a success. But what does being professional really mean? In this video, we'll look at six key attributes that identify and define you as a true professional. First of all, professionals have specialized knowledge. They may or may not have academic qualifications, but they have a wealth of knowledge and skills and are committed to developing and improving their abilities. They keep their knowledge and skills up to date so they can always deliver the best work possible. Professionals are competent. They get the job done. They're reliable. So if they know they can't deliver on their promises, they manage expectations up front and do their best to make the situation right. They don't make excuses, but focus on finding solutions. It's vital for professionals to be honest and to demonstrate integrity. They keep their word. If a project or job is beyond the scope of their expertise, they're not afraid to admit it. They never compromise their values and they will do the right thing, even when it means taking a harder road. Professionals are accountable. They always take full responsibility for what they say and do, especially when they've made a mistake. If they are challenged, they remain calm and businesslike instead of getting angry or upset. Genuine professionals practice good self-regulation. This means they stay professional under pressure. They are polite and respectful to the people around them. They show a high degree of emotional intelligence and are careful to consider the emotions and needs of others. They listen and observe. And they don't let a bad day impact the way they behave with colleagues or clients. Professionals look the part. They don't show up to work sloppily dressed or with untidy hair. They dress appropriately for the situation. This gives them an air of confidence. Are you demonstrating these characteristics to the people you work with? To learn more about how to gain a professional reputation, read the article that accompanies this video. <laughs> And we do have the article linked to this slide, so I'm assuming you went to the website linked to this slide, so you can go have a copy of this article. And so you see that J H for you at the end? Are you <laughs> demonstrating the traits of a professionalism? It's something to think about. And let's look at the official uh, definition that the dictionary provides. Um, the conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize a market professional or professional person. And it defines a profession as a calling requiring specialized knowledge and often long and intensive academic preparation, but not always. You know, you could be a professional working down at Foot Locker, okay, Starbucks, or the local 99 cent store. All right, these definitions imply that professionalism encompasses a number of different attributes, and together, these attributes identify a professional. And so, what are these attributes? Well, these are some of the key points in the article. And I have a few printed out copies here for those of you that need a handheld copy. And I do want to talk a little bit about the key points because professionalism is a trait that's highly valued, not just in the workforce, but in life, even in your family, when you're called to handle some family business that may occur from time to time. How you handle things is really important and highly valued, okay? Uh, and those attributes include specialized knowledge. So you might know how to reserve things very well and get things done when a family emergency comes up and your friends want to go on a girl's trip or a guy's trip or a co-ed trip, okay? So that's your specialized knowledge. You'll take the lead. I got the reservations, everyone, right? And then there's competency, you know? You certainly need to have a level of competency in your field. Now, I want to talk a little bit about competency because it says here the professionals get the job done. They're reliable and they keep their promises. That's really important. You have to be a person of your word. The most professional people that I've ever met in my life were people of their word. Okay, so that's a, 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 a huge part of competency. Okay, professionals don't make excuses, but they find what? Solutions. Solutions. Um, a plus plus. Okay. Um, honesty and integrity is important. Um, respect is a big part of that as well. You know, professionals exhibit these qualities. They keep their word and they can be trusted. Like it's implied that, that people that keep their word can be trusted. Okay, so that's very important. All right. Um, and more than this, professionals are humble. 
a project or a job falls outside the scope of expertise, they're not afraid to admit it. And they're willing to learn from it. Okay? All of these concepts, we are getting ready to shift and apply to your social media life. Stay on board. All right? Accountability, very important. Professionals hold themselves accountable for their thoughts, their words, and their actions, especially when they made a mistake. All right? And personal accountability is tied to honesty and integrity, and it's a vital element of professionalism in the real world and online and social media. Okay? Self regulation is a part of being a professional. Okay? Staying professional under pressure. Somebody tags you in something crazy on social media. You don't have to panic, share it, and say, oh my God, look at these people tag me and I don't have anything to do with it. You can just simply delete it. Untag yourself, delete it, report it, right? And so self-regulation is very important, okay? In the real world and in social media. And looking the part. You don't want to post anything crazy, and you don't want to be crazy looking on social media. And we're going to get deep into that in the next few slides, okay? So improve your own professionalism. You need to focus on improving in each of these areas. And this is a continuous, lifelong effort. Continuous improvement, okay? I have to really think about my presentation, what I was aware today, because I knew I was going to be presenting to students. Now, if it was a regular day, perhaps I would have gone on jeans and a false sweater, right? Presentation and professionalism matters and it's important. Okay? So, how does this matter for us in social media? Again, many of you are on social media for personal reasons, right? You connect with family. Everybody's aunties and uncles and grannies are on Facebook, right? All of your cool friends are sharing their life stories on Instagram. All of your crazy friends are Snapchatting away. All of your little sisters and brothers are on TikTok. <laughs> and everybody's on YouTube, right? And so how you roll in social media is important. Even the things that you chat. I do a lot of chatting in YouTube chats, right? People screenshot that type of stuff. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we do, I want to talk to you a little, about, a little bit more about the social media revolution because I'm not sure you all understand by way of data as we start to frame this by the numbers, how powerful, how relevant, and how important social media is. So let's take a look at this quick video on the social media revolution. Jot down two facts that stand out to you, by the way. Two data points that stand out. Thank <laughs> you. 
Stood out to you. Yes, in the back then you used to um, Yep. The millennials rather lose their sense of smell in social media. If you had to choose, they were asked if you had to choose, if you had to let go of one of your senses, in place of social media, what would it be? I don't have to smell nothing. <laughs> yes. 93% uh, of buying decisions are influenced by social media. 93%. No one cares about billboards anymore. It's a complete and total waste of corporate dollars, marketing dollars. Well, I mean, they just don't. Billboards are now for PR related messages to continue to build trust and confidence. They certainly don't work for selling products anymore. Uh, everybody uses Yelp, tags to friends, searches Twitter. Right? To find out what's hot, what's not. Somebody just asked me where to get some fish. I said, I don't know who's going to help. <laughs> Got the most the hottest trending things out. Anybody else? Anything that stood out? Yes. How many of you have licked the stamp? See, we debunked that myth. How <laughs> safety space is unique in that we debunk a lot of these myths. But you know, if you think about it, um, in all honesty, my daughter's sitting in there. I've never licked the stamp. There just aren't any adhesive folks or stamps out there anymore. They're all self adhesive now, mm -hmm. right? Um, I rarely get them to the art of sitting down and writing a letter. Still get them to do that from time to time. Like I'm mad at this stamp on the foot now. Okay, don't let that die. Right, Fred, today, please. <laughs> Anything else before we move on? Yes. And then yes. 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 Goldfish have a longer attention. Thank you. Yeah, goldfish have a longer attention span than us now. <laughs> Guilty. It's kind of a man of stunning, but not really when you think about all of the inference um, that we have um, coming. Yes, I know it's this fact that like um, two thirds of people get news, get news from social media that might be like Yeah, everybody get their news from social media? I do. I don't get my fake news from social media. I get my fake news from the White House. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but I do, you know, I follow various news sources. I follow traditional news sources. I follow non-traditional news sources. Uh, and so it is very difficult to trim the fat sometimes because you might hear something on YouTube that sounds great and it might align with your emotion, but it may not be factual. And so it's always a great idea to fact check when you're, when you're engaged in the news and getting your news on social media. But it's a fact. I mean, folks wake up and then get on Facebook and you see somebody passed away a celebrity or the pg and &E is going for another power outage, y'all. <laughs> First thing I saw on Twitter yesterday. Hopefully, we'll be affected. Okay. Anybody else before we move on? Yes. Um, uh, Nathan H. Uh, was born to 13 years old. And I, I, in my perspective, I feel like that's very bad because it puts pressure on young children as far as middle school to start thinking about their career. Absolutely. And you're like, where does the aspect of childhood go to people now that social media is in here? Like, it makes kids grow up faster than I do. I, I absolutely agree with you, and I think that it's parents' responsibility, no doubt, hands down. My daughters have a YouTube channel, and I post everything on their behalf. They have these TikTok accounts that are private. They only post one person that can see them as them. I don't care. I'm not thinking about them and their desire to be on any social media platform. And so if you're going to allow your children, your cousins, your, your, you know, your, your baby nephews and nieces to be on these social media platforms, you have to monitor them because there are adults on the other side closing their children. That's just a fact. Yes? Have you electronics? It looks like you and the brains are not both adults. Yeah, it's true. There's research, all kind of research out there, you know. Um, you know, my 13-year-old would would um, 
deflect and say, but I have a 4.0. <laughs> so they challenge you on new levels these days. But it's true, you know, exposing yourself to a lot of, you know, that inference can shorten your, your, your memory span, okay? So any other facts about social media? Yes, before we move on. I just thought it was notable that they pointed out that the number one hashtag is love. Yes, and a lot of people miss that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I think one thing that's important to note is that uh, the populations on these social media platforms are larger than the populations of home nations. That was one of the first data points that they put out. So that's where everyone is. And that's what we're talking about. Your social media versus persona. See something different? One of these things just doesn't belong here. Okay, but this is a very valid meme. It says me on Facebook versus me on Instagram, right? <laughs> and they, uh, different social media platforms are there for different reasons. So Facebook, you may be clean, you know, with no caffeine because your parents are on there and you might feel a little bit more ratchet on Instagram and then everything goes down on Twitter and Snapchat. We don't even want to see um, because those are just the varying levels of social media engagement. So you need to decide what platforms you're going to engage on and how you're going to engage on these platforms. Does that make sense? Any questions? Concerns? That's one of my favorites. So, you know, as we move forward and we start talking about this thing, I think one of the things that we start to think about is that a lot of folks are doing things on social media because they want more likes. And that there is a psychology behind people liking you and liking the things you do. And so when we make moves on social media, when we start posting things on social media, sometimes we don't think. Because all we need is likes. Ooh, right? And so I'm going to now share with you some examples, some very important examples of how when you're not paying attention, when you're not thinking through, because of the social pressure of social media, it can highly impact you and for a lifetime. Now there may be an advertisement in this video and I can't be responsible for the screen grab at the end. <laughs> You would think that in a time of such public accessibility, people would think twice about what they post in their social media accounts. But senseless humans never fail to amaze. The next time you wish you didn't have to go into the job that pays your bills, be careful for what you wish for. And for the love of God, don't post on social media. Here are 10 insane social media posts that got people fired from their teacher. 23-year-old <laughs> high school math teacher named Carly McKinney posted scantily clad photos of herself on Twitter and tweeting about being naked, wet, and stone. She was unsurprisingly fired immediately, especially since she gloated about the photos being taken in the staff parking lot. McKinney went on to be a social media celeb after her removal and became known as Curly Front Bear, with the hashtag Free Front Bear, making its way around the Twitter sphere. But the jury still stands. If you're a teacher, don't post news or drugs on social media. Daycare disaster. A single mother by the name of Caitlin Waltz took to her public Facebook wall to vent about her new job at a daycare center, posting things like, I start my new job today, but I absolutely hate working at a childcare center. And, lol, it's all good. I just hate being around a lot of kids. Needless to say, this didn't sit well with the Facebook community or her workplace. They let her know she did need to come back to work. But really, what did she expect? Oh, that on the last. Former Marine Sergeant Gary Stein was dishonorably discharged after bashing his boss on Facebook. Who was his boss? None other than Barack Obama himself. Stein went on a long rant about his problems with the U.S., ending it with, screw Obama, I will not follow all orders from him. Well, now I guess he doesn't have to. Sharpie, no, no. Even professional cheerleaders aren't immune to Facebook firing. Caitlin Davis was canned from her job cheerleading for the New England Patriots when a distasteful picture of her showed up on Facebook. She's shown making a duck face beside a passed out party goer who's covered in phallic symbols, swastikas, and the phrase, I'm a Jew. She's also holding a Sharpie in her hand, which did not help her case. Companies account. While many people are fired for posting obscenities on their personal Twitter accounts, Scott Bartosiewicz accidentally went one step further. As a social media strategist for New Media Strategies, he 
was signed onto the corporate Twitter account of Chrysler. Thinking he was on his own account, he rented. I find it ironic that Detroit is known as the hashtag Motor City, and yet no one here knows how to do epic drive. Not only was he fired, but Chrysler did not renew their contract with new media strategies. Ouch. Guys, students, you might think that after one of your sixth grade students drowns and dies during a field trip to the beach, you'd be a little more sympathetic. Instead, a teacher named Christine Rubio posted this on her Facebook profile. After today, I'm thinking the beach is a good trip for my class. I hate their guts. Wow, she was fired, but later on, a judge ruled that she could return to the classroom. Boston Marathon Baker. For some reason, this girl thought it would be funny to dress up as a victim of the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. Take a picture at work and tweet about it. The bombings left over 200 wounded and three dead, which is far from a laughing matter. She was soon fired from her job and her parents ended up getting death threats because of her mistake. Uh-oh, Cisco. When a big company offers you a high-paying job, it's not best to offend them. Tom O'Reilly had an offer from Cisco on the table, which was quickly taken away after she tweeted. Cisco just offered me a job. Now I have to wait the utility of a fatty paycheck to get the daily commute to San Jose and hating the work. One of the company's employees responded, who is the hiring manager? I'm sure they would love to know that you will hate the work. We here at Cisco are versed in the web. Sexist firefighters. Two firefighters <laughs> were terminated from the City of Toronto Fire Services for posting extremely sexist tweets. Matt Bowman, tweeting under the name at hero underscore Matt, posted, I'd never let a woman kiss my ass. If she tried something, I'd be like, hey, you get your ass back to the kitchen and make me some pie. Another tweet from the account of Lama Edwards read, was swatting her in the back of the head and considered abuse or a way to reset the brain. Ladies, beware. The AIDS joke. It's literally never okay to joke about race and AIDS, especially on social media for the world to see. As the communications director for the Internet Empire Interactive Court, Justine Sacco was let go for a racist tweet she uploaded before her flight to Cape Town. It read, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Despite having only 200 followers, the tweet was shared and spread around quickly to news organizations before she even landed. She deleted her account and apologized, but the damage has already been done. Do you know any of Hmm, wasn't that something? Who <coughs> you knew about some of those cases? Read them, saw them on social media. All right, so real quick, let's just have a quick discussion on your takeaways from the video. Now, I just for your knowledge, so I have to go back on the slide. I wrote through these comments with these out. But think of your favorite case in the bunch. And let's talk about which of these did they violate? Specialized knowledge, competency, honesty and integrity, accountability, self-regulation, looking the part. Anybody? So self-regulation, which one, which case? I think for most of them, they weren't holding themselves back and expressing their feelings. Like for the last one, that they were expressing a, a racist point of view and didn't come in that like, way to, not, not even like on it, just self-regulation. Yeah, I was stunned that the teacher was uh, upside down, twerking on the wall for the <laughs> world to see. That was uh, amazing. Um, Anybody else? What cases stood out to you? Which one was like, oh man, yes. When they said she'll leave the community when she got fired. For what? They said she'll leave the community from her house or job. Yeah, no, well, she said she hated the work. She said she needs to weigh a fatty paycheck against the commute, hating the work and a commute. Is that okay? So it's like, I'm going to get this fat paycheck, but I'm really going to hate this job and it's a horrible commute. That's what she said. That was a lack of competency, huh, no self-regulation, certainly not looking the part. You're supposed to say, got a new job at Cisco. And text your friend and say, I got to weigh the odds of a fatty paycheck against a computer, right? Keep that internal in this friend circle, not on public social media. Anything else stand out to anybody? I thought the cheerleader was just, I was just stunned by that one as well. I mean, especially with the, you know, looking the part and like, you know, the specialized knowledge just in terms of like cheerleaders are like the epitome of leadership and goodness and grace. Um, as a cheer, former high school cheerleader, I would say. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that was stunning to me. Oh, um, I was going to say it wasn't in, this, in these examples. 
examples, but there's that NASA intern who got accepted to like run for an internship, mm -hmm. but she tweeted a vulgar statement. She's like, oh, I got accepted, but like she was using it. I got an M11 intern at NASA, bitches. Something like that? Yeah. Yeah, no. No way. Excuse my language. <laughs> you can't use that. Um, but that's really inappropriate, right? So even, again, this is like, like lacking, you know, that accountability for your words. You know, some folks are, are offended by curse words, so it's just best to stay away from them. Especially when you're expecting something great, like you got a job. Yes. So the one about Obama, <clears throat> how many times have like told their first name? Well, at the time, they, the I, I guess with the military, you, you ultimately report to the commander in chief, yeah. and so to say that you're not going to take orders from your boss is pretty irresponsible, no matter regardless of your political positioning, right? I mean, I don't know anybody in the military here, current, former, take a speak on that. I think that you're a call to serve whoever the commander in chief is, regardless of your political affiliation. I believe. Might even look that up and shout it out if they want to. Anything else about the video? Craze, right? Well, listen, a lot of folks create what are called uh, offensive, fake Instagram, fake, fake profiles, second or third or fourth YouTube channel. I have like five YouTube channels, um, right? And, 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 and you do that for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you don't want people follow you, maybe you want one of your channels to be about politics and the other one to be about beauty products, and you want to keep things in your fans and your followers separated, and that's okay, um, you know, but according to Brooke Aaron Duffy, an assistant professor of communication at Cornell University, the main reason that her students have this to account is fear of monitoring of employee. Why are you afraid of what your employee is looking at? What are you doing? I mean, perhaps it's just maybe you just shouldn't do it on social media, whatever that is. Uh, okay. Uh, and even if you are hiding behind a username that's not associated with your name, who's to say that someone can't screenshot it or now screen record it and post it to the internet and have that be, you know, have it being tied to your name in a Google search result, right? Screenshots are everywhere now. So folks are doing that all the time. Right? Just when you find folks that you post, even when you post and delete something. Folks will screen catch it and recirculate it back into the social media cyberverse. Okay, I'm going to link out to this uh, article. So, did you know that Instagram is testing hiding the likes? Yeah. yeah. What do y'all think about that? Like you won't be able to see how many likes somebody has on a photo. Or their follower account in some places. Yes. Why would they do that? Well, that's a great question. You know, um, so I'm going to read something here. Um, hiding likes is probably a win for the sanity of humanity and a boom to creativity. Before, people often self-censored and declined to share posts they worried wouldn't get enough likes or deleted posts that didn't. They instinctually bend their public persona towards manicured selfies and images that make their life look glamorous <coughs> than what was authentic or that they wanted to communicate. Meanwhile, viewers would see high like counts on friends or influencers' posts, compare those to their own smaller like counts, and feel ashamed or inadequate. Hiding likes is probably a win for the sanity of humanity and a boom to creativity. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of social pressure there. And so this article that, again, is, is, is linked into the, set, into the slides that you'll get uh, gives you a little bit of history about why they started uh, hiding likes um, and where they've been doing it, okay? And it's to reduce social pressure, okay? Instagram does want to be an app where people feel comfortable expressing themselves and can focus on the photos they share rather than how many likes they get. That's what the spokesperson tells us every so if Nicki Minaj lost her mind, she said, I'm leaving Instagram. <laughs> What's the point? And so that helps you understand that people really are there for the likes. Yes. Yeah, because I think a lot of people like they both know what other people are thinking. People are thinking about me like if I like that picture, it would other people like that picture too, like to know 
know the thing. Okay, if you're not gonna know what or other the thing is, then I don't think social media really is the best way to do it. Absolutely. Um, I encourage you to look at this article and take a good look at what happened um, when they give the likes um, and how that affected people um, with audiences, with influence among, influencers among five to 20,000 followers, okay? And so I think that, uh, again, this is their Instagram statement about it. Um, the early testing has been positive. Um, and again, it's a place where they want people to feel comfortable, not make money off of their looks. It's not to say that you can't make money off your looks. It just shouldn't be based on your like count. It's my likes if they like it. If they don't, they don't. Right? Any thoughts about that? It's very controversial. Yes. You would know your likes, though. So if somebody wanted to like support you with their products, you know, like, like if they're going to be on a small screen, they would still ask for this. I'm sure, yeah. Like, as influencers, what? People that collaborate on Insta, uh, social media, they want to know how many followers you have and what kind of influence you have. But then again, that goes back to like your the original influencer, the email list. And I don't want to turn this into a social media marketing class, but that go turns it back to your original influencer, your personal email list. And so there are folks running around like 40, 50,000 emails, and that becomes a great value to the influencer if you can deliver something directly to somebody in the inbox. Somebody else have hands up somebody? Yes. Well, I was just going to say, uh, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, YouTube, look at your followers and the amount of followers you have. And like, you can get paid on the amount of hate comments you have on people, which would be a good thing or a bad thing. Absolutely. And uh, that's played out in a variety of ways on YouTube where folks have millions of followers and post some very questionable uh, activity on their pages in the name of, you know, garnering more attention. Okay. And that's just one platform. Uh, you know, it's not to say not all platforms are eliminating the like counts. Yes. All right, can you talk a little bit about so something I noticed is students will have, you know, their their private accounts and then they'll have maybe they'll have and so that they'll use for course assignments where you post on a course website or whatever. What I don't see is legit student professional social media accounts and seeing them engaging in the online communities, and that's where a lot of networking and where you get seen now. And so can you, can you put in your two cents on that? Because that's a concern I personally have, but you're the expert, so I think you're a better person to talk about. I think I'm gonna switch to this slide while I talk about this. I think you're absolutely right. The students that I have seen have a lot of success on social media platforms are the students that engage in entrepreneurial and academic activities. Like they talk about what they're doing in class, they talk about being a student, or maybe they have a side business, they sell t-shirts or coffee beans, or or uh, bracelets, necklaces, jewelry, beans, I've seen it all. Um, and they're communicating and collaborating on social media. They get together and, and they're having events and programs and, and having vendors come on campus and, and marketing one another's businesses. And so I'm seeing on Instagram, um, some individual students do some great things and also our student organizations. Our student organizations, if you type in CSUVB on Instagram, and look at some of the professional work that our student organizations on, are doing on Instagram, you'll see very quickly how you can utilize the platform, and what I like to say, utilize your social media powers for good, okay? It is time for you to start um, leveraging your social capital on social media. And so if you're doing great in your classes, you're getting a 4.0, or you got an A on a research paper, or you discover something great in your science class, those are all wonderful things that you can engage with folks on, on social media that later on become social capital for you to leverage when you're out there networking and um, working to get a job, okay? Because as we can see right here, it's more than a notion. Social media is more than a notion. Employers look for you now on social media. 94% of employers use social media in candidate recruitment. They're out there on LinkedIn, they're on Facebook, they're even on Instagram, recruiting candidates. I see it all the time, I get direct messages all the time, okay? There are even universities that are teaching two unit outcomes applicable to the digital age. So now college and universities want students to understand how to market their skills to their employers. How are you going to market your skills to your employers beyond your resume? Any ideas? Social media. Social media, right? It's a great way to do it. LinkedIn, if you want to stay completely professional and above board and safe, 
LinkedIn is a great place to, to start that journey, okay? We also want students to develop personal and professional networking skills as a part of your digital, the digital age, okay? As a part of a, a professional and personal outcome that we want for you, okay? Social recruiting is on the rise. Digital experts say that it's becoming increasingly difficult to separate recruitment from social media in this day and age. Employers are extensively using online venues, including LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, to broadcast available positions. In fact, it's becoming an essential part of companies' current recruitment strategy. There's a job section on Facebook. Has anybody tapped into it? You should check it out. There's an actual job section. Just go on Facebook if you haven't searched jobs, okay? 78 of employers, 78 percent of employers have hired through LinkedIn, meaning they've recruited the individual, interviewed them, and hired them on the LinkedIn. Okay, I've been recruited for UC Santa Cruz. I turned it down because I love this guy through um, <laughs> through LinkedIn. They looked at my LinkedIn profile and said I was qualified for an associate vice president position and offered me to apply. Okay. 41% of college students use LinkedIn in the job search. So as you approach graduation, you're going to use LinkedIn um, more likely than not in your job search, okay? Some of the most common mistakes that people use, that students uh, make on LinkedIn and on all social media profiles is an incomplete profile, grammatical errors. If you ever spell, folks, and do grammar, Unprofessional photos, lack of personal summary or keywords for search, like your keywords like communication major or business major or science major, right? Um, and attempts to make inappropriate connections. So you just go straight for the gusto. You just go straight to Zuckerberg. I want to be your friend. Recommend me for a job. So don't make those mistakes. Just build your social media profile by making the appropriate connections. You start by connecting with the Cal State East Bay community faculty staff and fellow students and alumni on LinkedIn. Okay? And then something I would just want to add on to that sure. is there's a difference between having a LinkedIn profile. A lot of students don't even have a picture. It's your, your stuff, it's not you guys personally, but it's really incomplete. There's no information that lets us learn anything about you, and you don't engage in the community. So just having that account does jack squat for you. So you do have to engage. So, you know, I know a lot of times it's intimidation and students don't want to, oh, I don't want to sound dumb. I don't want to sound like I have no friends. But like, if you, if you start adding people to your network that are relevant and you're like, oh, hey, Dr. So-and-so, like, oh, I loved your talk at the CSR today. Like, you know, I really like this point. Like, could you talk a little bit more about it? Right? Or like, oh, I missed this point or this, you know, like this part went over my head. Nobody is going to be like, wow, that person's an idiot. People are like, wow, that person's using resources to build up their know. That's going to reflect positively on you. That is one of the things that I see constantly on the professional social media platforms. You know, and it's just, it, it like it hurts my heart. It's just like, oh, like you're just making yourself invisible. And everyone goes to social media now. It's those people, the people that are like, no, I'm, I'm resisting social media because I'm being stubborn about it. It's like, you're, you're choosing to resist technology for you. And resisting opportunity. You know, my family had the opportunity to be on the cover of Bay Area Parent Magazine because of an ad that I saw on social media. My daughter now dances for a professional dance company and they just performed at Spelman Morehouse Homecoming in Atlanta um, because of me having access to social media and learning about the dance company on social media. So you, it is access to opportunity. Again, when you frame it, think about it in terms of using your social media powers for good and not engaging on you know, any type of personal activity. Uh, you know, what you don't want to do is you don't want to use social media to vent and you don't want to use social media as a sounding board. That's never appropriate for social media. Um, and that's the mistake that a lot of people make and that creates a snowball effect, okay? Um, if you improve and refine your skills, knowledge, and experience in the real world, you will improve your content and your posts on social media. Um, choose to engage on any of those social platforms and all the ways you can improve your skills is by communicating with folks in public, coming to events and programs like this. So I applaud you all for being here. Um, also, you know, you have to learn how to network professionally so that you can communicate about yourself and about who you are on social media. Um, and that takes time. 
You know, you may know that right now you're a budding journalist and, 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 and journalism is what you want to do. And so start connecting with other fellow journalists. Join a couple of journalism groups, of other journalists, college student majors across the country. And start engaging with folks. You'll start finding out about conferences and meetings. See, these are all positive things. This is not anything about anybody's boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, drama and all that stuff. Okay? You have total control, though. However, uh, what you post and what you engage in on your social media site. So there are a couple of things that I want to uh, draw your attention to to help you build your skills and experience in this area so that when you engage on social media, you'll be a superstar and you'll achieve the required results. This is on the Cal State East Bay's website. This is Academic Advising and Career Education. They have some amazing resources on interviewing. And this is not even just interviewing for a job. This can help you with just communicating. Some of you that may not feel comfortable communicating with folks one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, you know, or even in groups. So here's some before the interview um, information, during the interview, including how to dress, uh, the 30-second commercial, which we'll get into later. Uh, and so I encourage you to take a look at these, uh, these resources here and engage in these resources to kind of help you build, build your skill set. And then everybody needs a 30 second commercial. Making that positive first impression um, with a summary of your skills and talents and accomplishments is really important. And you can run into somebody that can give you an opportunity anywhere. You can run into President Alicia, who is the president of Cal State East Bay right now when you're leaving in this building. And what would you say to him? What if you always wanted to be a university president and you know he's retiring? Can I get your spot, Mr. President? I'm ready. Right? And you have to think about that. And so I think that this is a really great resource for you because as you continue on with your uh, college career, you're going to have lots of opportunities to network and you want to make sure that you're ready with your elevator speech. And so this is a resource that I'm providing for you in the slides and there's a link to it. Okay? Any questions? about your social media persona, fake profiles, real profiles, and how to maintain your business online so that you can be your best self. How often would you say on their account that is maybe their more professional account, like how often is enough to be engaging with One to two times a week. Um, I con consult my clients, they post two to five times a day, every day. Social media is a daily engagement. When you're on professional platforms like LinkedIn, if you're a current student, it makes sense for you to post once, once or twice a week, if that. Okay. Question. Yes. Um, so I attended like two, three different undergrad schools in my whole entire undergrad career. This will be my fourth one. Mm -hmm. So do you recommend putting basically like your work experience, like even if it's like retail, um, yes. and like two different like community colleges in your LinkedIn account, or does it show that like you're just like unstable uh, for like, you know, somebody who's looking at it? Well, you know, I think that whatever you post on your profile is your story. And so I don't think that it um, shows that you're insta unstable, but I think that it does show that you have a story. You have to be prepared to tell that story. So why you went from three different colleges and universities right. is important as well. And so think about how you want to craft your story around every circumstance that happens to you and be honest about and authentic about who you are. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're about to wrap up. So if you guys have burning questions, email me. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Margaret. Thank you. We have cards here and a couple of those professionalism handouts. And I still have some business cards here up front. You can email me anytime. Thanks, everyone.